This is Hannibal here from the Hannibal TV. Um, audio is bad. And I am with the man who has, the audio is bad on your end? Yeah, it's distorted. Can you understand me at least? I, I, I'm i trying to figure out what to do. Okay. Because we are a lot, we are on the air now and yeah. I can hear you. Perfect. Before, now it's, now it's uh, all distorted. Okay. Well, now this, I can do. for the fans out there, this is the former uh, world-class championship wrestling TV show producer, Mickey Grant. He was on uh, about a month or so ago, but we didn't even scratch the surface uh, of some of the topics that uh, the fans wanted me to get into. And now he has permission to release a special director's cut of his Chris Adams documentary that he produced. So he has a GoFundMe going for that. We have the link in the description and at the top of the comments. And if anyone gives tips on this, it's going to go to to Mickey Grant to put towards his uh, his proposed documentary. So how are you doing today, Mickey? Uh, thank you, Hannibal. <laughs> I think you kind of know how I'm doing. It's been kind of a rough time. Uh, the reason I want to do a director's cut is pretty simple. Uh, when I originally did it, I was hoping for a broadcast, which has happened to all my other films. And uh, I say films because, uh, you know, the usually are in theaters and uh, broadcast, including CBC and BBC and everybody. And um, uh, with a Gentleman's Choice, it was kind of weird. I, I think a lot of it was simply because it was wrestling. And I thought we'd overcome that. Uh, I, I, a friend of mine helped set it up to where I, to where I was going to be on Jay Leno who's a wrestling fan. And uh, uh, <laughs> the, the week that I, I was supposed to be on, they went on strike. And part of what made Beyond the Ring work is Ron uh, Howard was involved in it. And uh, he's right down the hall from Jay. So I was hoping all that was going to work. Because it's a, it's a over. It sounds like it would be a depressive film, but it's really an uplifting film, and uh, uh, you know to help people. Because when you see how strong Chris was battling uh, GHB addiction, uh, you know, and and it, Chris could win at anything, and and that's always one of the problems with addiction, which I've experienced. And um, uh, so the idea of doing a longer cut is that, you know, I'm not looking at a uh, broadcast. I'm looking at covering more of the topics that uh, plague Chris and also uh, just really, I think, emotional things. There was one scene I had to cut because it just did not fit the flow of the film. And that was a scene where uh, Kevin Von Erich had flown to the UK. And Kevin is, if there's anybody who speaks directly from the heart, it's Kevin Von Erich. And uh, he was with Chris's family and they uh, wrote a, uh, put up like a poem and wrapped it around the roots of a tree and planted it in this really old church, probably about 500 years old. And I shot the scene with him in front of the tree, which was now much larger. And, uh, you know, that that's a beautiful scene. And there's a lot of other scenes like that, which will, you know, help define who Chris was, especially to the wrestling fans. And it should be to everybody. I mean, that's that's the thing. Uh, wrestlers like yourself put their heart, their mind, everything totally into uh, their art. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's as powerful as 
you know, an Olympic sport. And and Chris was really uh, early on trying to be an Olympian. He was, and his brother won two, uh, what, silver medals in the Olympics. And, um, uh, you know, when I, when I, I, I went so deep in the story, this was three years of doing interviews, you know, uh, I'd always enjoyed Chris. Um, and you know, he knew that, I, I, he was just an absolutely wonderful person. And one of my greatest concerns was whether or not I, you know, I did not want to portray him badly. And the first person I think I talked to other than Kevin, Kevin's family was in tears after they saw the film. I think Kevin was concerned how I was going to present wrestling and he was very happy with it. And then Jeannie, uh, Jeannie, who's I guess living in Las Vegas right now, uh, she was his uh, wife and then uh, Steve Austin's wife. Jeannie is about the most wonderful person and beautiful that you could ever meet. You know, so many people don't realize how, let me change hands here, how amazing uh, you are, how amazing uh, wrestling is. They, they have these, uh, you know, bizarre ideas. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I uh, have always known that none of that bizarreness uh, was true. Uh, wrestlers are, you know, heroic, like from Greek times. And and now, anyway, I can rattle on. <laughs> I'll shut up. What's your next question? Well, we did have one fan, Dave, oh, gave I'm, I'm, $5. I'm, I'm, so sure, we'll put $5 towards your director's cut for the Chris Adams director's cut. But there was something you wanted to talk to me about regarding Black Bart. I didn't do this interview. I have a I'm hearing. I'm. I'm slightly hearing it. Uh, I, I. I don't. It must just be the uh, program tonight or something. You are asking more. I. I could barely hear about uh, the Black Bart. What, what Black was Bart. that again? Black Bart. You had something you wanted to say about what Black Bart said about David Von Erich. Oh man, I'm 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 sorry. It's coming in really garbled, so I don't think it's my phone or anything. I think it, uh, you know, has something to do with uh, uh, the, either the internet or the program. Uh, I'm playing with my audio, trying to because see I think the fans helping. can hear it. The fans can hear because they're commenting. Uh, uh, well, would you like me to just kind of go on about my ideals about the director's cut? Go on about that and about this Black Bart thing. Uh, you to say. Uh, sometimes when you talk a little bit lower, I start to hear what you're saying. Okay, well, we'll let just go on about what you want to talk about since you can't seem to hear me. Give me a second. I'm going to hit ref <laughs> well, I think Hurricane Maverick said earlier that Mickey is a funny character, and I agree he is. Uh, there's something wrong. Oh, here he is. Let's see. Now I can hear you. Now you can hear me? Uh, okay. The, you sent me a video clip of Black Bart talking about David Von Erich's death that you had a problem with. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, it's just... Uh... I think what happens is over time, people uh, add to it. I'm trying to remember what the first things that upset me about that. Well, one, uh, David wasn't left in a hotel room for, I think he says, three weeks. And then he talks about Saki being, a, a, what, 100 times. I, I hate saying anything negative. I actually heard that part. I agree with you. Saki is not a hundred times more strong than regular I, I can alcohol. continue on with that and I'll, I'll, well, I'll just go ahead and Okay, well, he's gone. He's talking about a clip. Uh, if you search it up, Black Bart on David Von Erich's death and he knew David and he had an issue with that. But uh, now It's still not working. 
Okay, well, I'll let you just oh, respond. I say okay, one, give me, give me one second more. All right. This black Bart claimed that uh, sake, which you can get at any sushi place, is a hundred times stronger than regular alcohol. Which I've had sake, and that's wrong. But he wanted to explain. Oh, oh man, I, I'm sorry. It's still really distorted. I, I can kind of guess maybe what you're saying. Um, the, uh, the sake thing, and then for instance, how long it took to fly to Japan. And, uh, you know, David was a really wonderful guy. Nobody related to him as a druggie or anything like that. And, um, you know, he was just a, you know, flat out Texan. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I have a hard time believing a lot of this stuff about, about uh, that's being said about David. You know, there have been rumors over a lot of years. And uh, uh, David, what you see is what you got. And he was just a wonderful person. All right, let's see if you can hear me now. I'm going to have to hit. Okay, well, this is going to be a bit of a strange interview. I'll interact with you fans on here um, in between. How is everyone tonight? It's still just started again. Should we start this entire thing over again, Hannibal? Well, maybe we could do it another day. And it's uh, still, I mean, it's so garbled. I can't. But we can hear you. And you, you, I, you. Keep, I keep hitting. Uh, <laughs> the, uh... All right. This is uh, a little strange. I'll do a booze update because I think I'm going to have to throw in the towel on Nikki, Mickey for tonight here. He seems to be having a phone issue. Oh, it's still it's still doing it again. Okay. Should, should I'll, let, I'll let you talk. We can hear you. You talk for whatever you want to get, whatever you want to say, and we'll have you back another I, time. I, I can't I can't understand you. I don't know what's causing this. You know, it's it's really it's really weird. Um I'm checking my audio levels, everything, and, uh, uh, I, you know, I don't know what it is. Want, want me to hang up and then I call you again? I I, I think you should just talk yeah. and say I, what you want to say. I'm sorry. Just, just say what you want to say, and I think we'll give up for tonight after you say it. Uh, I, 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 it's not intelligible. Is it okay if I hang up and then I try it again? Yes. Okay. All right. I'll get in. Uh, his network must be out of whack, but he's actually having financial problems as well. So anyone that wants to uh, give him money towards his director's cut, I'm sure will be helpful. Still, are, are you there? Can you hear me? I'm still distorted. Let me try it again. Okay. I'm going to give up on him in a second here. He's not doing great, Derek. He does have a GoFundMe. I think he needs enough money to buy a new cell phone because... Uh, How's this? We can hear you loud and clear. I, when you first started talking, I could understand you. Now I can't. I'm trying to... Okay. Ha, now try. I lowered the volume. Just, just try and. Oh no, that that improved it. Just a second. Okay. Talk, talk again. Can you hear me? Yeah, I barely can. This All is right. okay. Well, I will if go you can with hear this. me, that? it's good. But just in case my audio goes again, why don't you just talk, tell some of your stories, and and say what you want for the next fifteen minutes. <laughs> just talk. That's the third band, problem. we can hear you well. We can hear you well. Well, well now it's working well. Okay. Uh, now that I lowered the audio, there's no distortion. Okay. Well, there were some fans asking about Iceman King Parsons. Maybe you could talk about him. Oh, Iceman was always Iceman was always wonderful and uh, wonderful in interviews and uh, you know a great wrestler. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he I, you know, there's absolutely nothing negative I could ever say about Iceman. I did not know him that well, 
but anytime we did location pieces with him, uh, which we did several, uh, he, he was absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, he, he, um, he w went on to be in a lot of other uh, wrestling programs. He, Iceman King Parsons was absolutely great. That's good. How's my audio now? Okay, let me let me lower the volume again. It started distorting. Go ahead. <laughs> How's the audio now? Okay, it's it's doing that thing again. Okay. Well, how about okay. we we? I, I, I'll I'll just talk like you said yeah. for a few minutes. Um, you know, the um uh, whole reason I wanted to do Gentleman's Choice was from a um, small clip I had. I thought about it for over two years because I kept thinking it was kind of disingenuous for me to do something with it. The last thing I wanted to do was, uh, you know, take any advantage of uh, Chris's death. And uh, he was a good friend. And uh, I, I liked him a great deal. And so I had this piece, which was, um, uh, it, it, I, I was shooting a segment for that show we were trying to get off the ground uh, with Chris, and he had an investor who uh, had a horrible divorce, and, uh, uh, you know, he lost all of, the investor lost all of his money. And uh, we, like, at the very end, we were in a production facility that I used to run. And um, uh, this guy's check bounced. And, uh, you know, they wouldn't release the footage. And what we'd done is shot all the location pieces, everything leading up to the fights. And then we did a big show uh, that Chris organized in Oak, uh, in Oklahoma. Uh, I'm trying to think of the town, and it was it was near where Bill Mercer was born, and we um, it was a fantastic show, and so we had cut all the location pieces, which were fantastic. Chris Chris really liked the way I uh, portrayed the wrestlers behind the scenes. And we, um, uh, we, you know, it, it, it was going to be unusual in that it was going to be a 30 minute show. So it had all this material from both the uh, Hill and the baby face uh, leading up to the fight. And uh, it, uh, um, you know, so, so it was like, 15 minutes of behind the scenes material. Um, when I say behind the scenes material, this is like how HBO eventually in Showtime portrayed the fights. They would show uh, three weeks of uh, boxers training and all of that and what they fought. And uh, I'd done a fairly large amount of boxing, including Don King. And so we, um, uh, that was, you know, our approach. And so when we, we were, so the show was in big chunks. We had all the location pieces. We had the, you know, uh, wrestling matches, which were the cum culmination of it all. And uh, we uh, uh, were then going to put it together. It wasn't a lot of editing. But it was, uh, you know, uh, about two thousand dollars worth, and so the check bounced, and that was uh, pretty much the end of the show, and that was devastating to Chris. I was, I was happy to, you know, and I had been, you know, often working for free. Chris was never, never in favor of that. He always, uh, in my opinion, believed in fan people. And so, uh, you know, the thing died. And, uh, it, you know, it was very, very depressing to Chris. And, you know, I, 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 
I think that played a big role in the upcoming things that happened to him. And you combine that with um, GHB, you know, Chris, Chris uh, previously had it really been any kind of addict and the ghp is what did him in and 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 i think a lot of other wrestlers because if you're so often to keep your job you had to have that uh you know carry von eric look and and injectable steroids were one of the you know main ways to get that look and uh unfortunately and to sleep at night, GHB was, um, you know, the um, way to go. And uh, uh, un unfortunately, it's one of the most addictive drugs there is. Uh, so anyway, the, um, sorry, I keep saying anyway, uh, that is one of the, my main points in Gentleman's Choice because in high schools, at least across the United States, um, it's a cheap drug. Uh, $20 gets you, you know, I don't know what its exact current price is, but at the time I shot the movie, $20 got you five hits and you felt drunk as a skunk. And within about five hours, it was out of your system. And uh, so uh, baseball players, lots of athletes did it because when they were drug tested, it would show nothing was, nothing was in them. And uh, like I was saying earlier, so much was left out of the film. When you, when you make a movie and try to be competitive with film festivals and whatnot, you, uh, uh, it's gotta have a certain rhythm of uh, flow and, uh, you know, you can't simply go on and on. And then the director's cut, I don't plan to do that. I just plan to introduce uh, more material uh, that heightens the emotion of what Chris was going through. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it, it's still going to be called Gentleman's Choice. And that's why I contacted my main investor and asked him uh, if it was okay that I did this. And, uh, you, you know, and he, he was in agreement. Uh, and it would help me. I've, I've, I started having lots of medical problems. I've, I've probably been in the hospital about 30 times or more since um, my last trip to Libya. Uh, I've initially been misdiagnosed and, uh, you know, my uh, lower back is inoperable. I, I think I sent you some of my um, MRIs. Uh, it's, it's a mess. And, uh, you know, I, the fact that I can even move around some now is uh, is amazing, but it's affected my work. Uh, all my life, I have been someone who could hit at 10 to 14 hour days, pretty intensive, and do everything, shooting, writing, you name it. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I, I you know, wasn't able to do that. So, you know, it's it's been, it's been a difficult uh, time. Um, I had someone last night attack me for my GoFundMe regarding myself. And it turns out they didn't realize I'd ever uh, completed a TV show. And I, I sent them links to them and, uh, uh, you know, they, they didn't know anything, but they thought I was uh, the biggest scumbag possible. And hey, maybe they're right. All I know is uh, every day I get up and try as hard as I can, the same as I've done uh, when I was successful, when I was turning out uh, product constantly. And, um, um, you know, that's, uh, like I say, maybe, maybe it's just my fault.
All right, we'll try this again. Can I can I try to restart this thing again? Because it, it yes. seems like you, that works. Give, you give can, it. okay. We'll, we'll we'll give that a shot. Uh Sean, I'm gonna ask him about UFOs. And every dollar counts. Thanks there, Tom, for the one dollar. Um Nick Pope, the former British head of uh the defense committee's uh UFO investigation investigators coming on tomorrow 1 30 p.m i i love the stuff i've seen that you've done on ufos uh i i sure believe that they exist oh you saw the question great yeah um my father was an air force pilot his and pretty much his whole career and in uh great falls montana uh, he, he was landing. He, he flew these tests where they would test our radar systems. And I guess he was flying either a C-47 or a 120, uh, C-123. This was back in the early 50s. And he uh, landed. And the ground crew, everybody was looking up in the sky. And there were objects that were very visible and they were moving at an estimated speed of four or 5,000 miles per hour. And uh, the control tower confirmed that uh, a few hours, not a few hours, less than an hour later, they tracked them over Los Angeles and, and nothing else was said about it. And so I, I without question, believe uh, that they exist. Now, does the infamous? Oh, it's doing it again. Okay. This is so <laughs> weird. Question: Can you? Okay, read... I'm going. I'm going to hit the uh, circle thing. And... All right. I'm sorry about this, guys. That he's having these issues, but uh, he needs money. He probably doesn't have the greatest cell phone, so keep that in mind for his GoFundMe. Uh... How's that? Uh, can you hear oh, me? Now? Doing it again. Okay, read more the more question. Time. Read the question. Oh, just a second. It nearly started again. Just okay. a second. Uh, talk again. I've got it really low audio. Can you read? Can you see this question on the screen? No, that that didn't help, unfortunately. All right. Uh, I'm I'm going to try it one more time. Okay. I'm going to try and get him to just read the questions from here on out. Otherwise, we'll give up. So I'm sorry for this. Uh, I've got other interviews coming up soon. Uh, it's still just started. Uh, I'll try it one more time. All right. Uh, let me let me move the volume down. Maybe there's something okay. weird with that because it it improved uh, significantly. Uh, keep talking, and I'll tell you. Can you see the questions on the screen? Can you read Are you there? Yes. Can you read the questions yeah. on the screen? Say something again, Animal. Say something again. Yeah, right? now I got you. All right. Can you read the question on the screen? Because I can put the questions uh, on the yeah, screen. It's, it's pretty small. I'm trying to enlarge it. Okay. Well, he's he's asking if you were around when Colonel De Beers ripped the boot off of Kerry Von Erich and the foot came off, and if any footage of that exists. Uh, no, I I wasn't I wasn't there then. Uh, I can say something about that though. Uh, Gary Hart wanted uh, it to be known that Chris had lost his foot, and he felt it would be a tremendous inspiration to so many people. And um, uh, Fritz thought it would be uh, like a sideshow thing. And you know, would it let that happen? You know, but I, I think Gary's idea was, uh, was without question correct. Now there's another fan. Here we go. It's doing it again. I'm going to do what I've been doing, which is lower the volume and then raise it a little. Okay. There has to be something that's connected to the program. Cause I've never, I've never seen anything like this happen before. All right. Now I'm, I'm starting to hear you. Go okay. ahead. Tom wants to know your opinion of the 1897 UFO crash in Aurora, Texas. Oh, wow. 
yeah, I've read something about that. Uh, I had a really good friend who uh, was named Dr. Uh, oh, I'm trying to think of his name. He was a radiologist. And the EFO Society had appointed him to be the uh, medical director. Um, God, I'm trying to think of his name. I, I got flown to other countries with him. And uh, 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 Dr. Bobby, uh, Bobby, um, oh, I, you know, maybe it will come to me in a minute. But uh, he was appointed the uh, medical doctor who would be on the you know, initial team to examine UFOs. And uh, uh, he talked to me about that. And he, he was a hundred percent positive about it. Uh, one time we both were in Vietnam and uh, we left him in Ho Chi Minh City. And when we got back, it turned out uh, that uh, he had been talking to a lot of the communist authorities about UFOs and, um, uh, you know, kind of created a, a big stir. His name was Bobby uh, Lawler, Lawler. And, uh, and, and it, just about anybody who's been intensely involved in UFO investigations will be familiar with his name. Let's test this again. How, uh, how can you hear it's me? doing it again. Let me do what I've been doing, which is lower the volume and then raise it a little. How's that? It's not bad, but I think... No, it's still not working. Okay. Uh, talk again. I can hear you. How can you hear me? It starts. It starts when okay. I get it down really low. Uh, can you say something again? Say something again. Uh, I'm going to hit the... Uh, all right, guys, you can help him out, get a new phone. He does have a GoFundMe link. He needs to be able to edit again to make money. He also, I also have the link to the Vimeo uh, version of his Chris Adams documentary. If you click on that, uh, that'll help. Him now out. I can hear you. Okay, Mark Welby tips you two ninety nine, but I'll let you kind of just. End this however you want because we're having all these technical issues. Yeah. And we'll try this again down the road. But whatever you want to say, just go on as long as you want because we can hear you perfectly. Okay. I I, I appreciate it, Hannibal. Uh, I, I hope your audience fully realizes what a great interviewer you are. I'm not just saying that to kiss your ass or anything, but uh, half the times I've been interviewed are as a producer, having interview people, uh, you know, the focus is more on their ego than um, on the subject. So uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, it's it's been rough to get online and uh, and beg. And uh, in the U.S., we don't have much of a, um, a safety net. And I, I'm saying this for so many other people, especially during this COVID time, you know, and uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to understand when, you know, people get in that situation uh, that you're not trying to scam, that you're uh, <laughs> just trying to, you know, survive day to day. And, uh, uh, you know, I think in maybe, maybe in the end about this period of time, uh, this may be known as other than the deaths. I can't imagine the deaths. I've had two friends die from it at this point. Uh, you know, it's, it's just horrific times. And, uh, uh you know, it's uh, in the U.S. We're not really, you know, there's not, like I said, very little safety net. I, I'm, I'm trying to not be political. I look back at uh, my times involved in wrestling and most of the issues uh, that I think prevented it from really taking off until world class. And lots of uh, viewers, listeners might not realize that. 
but it it um, was small independent shows on individual TV stations around the country. And nothing like the WWE or even our show could have been conceived to have uh, won such a large audience. Um, my, my attitude about it all was that, uh, you know, the audience was massive. And, you know, to me, it was a no brainer. Uh, if you do a show and you do it excellent, you know, it's like, uh, what's the movie about baseball? The, you know, they'll come. And um, I, I, I was really into doing uh, research projects about when I was getting my master's degree about wrestling, because really nobody had done that. And, uh, and I'm not trying to brag about that, but really nobody had, it, had done that. And the uh, uh, audience um, wasn't, uh, you know, for the most part, advertising people thought it was like trailer trash. And in no shape, form, or fashion was it like that. Bill Mercer it would get on flights. You know, he did the... Uh, uh, he did all kinds of sports broadcasting, especially for university. And Bill, Bill is to me one of the greatest uh, persons as well as broadcasters in history. Uh, he was like a father to me. Um, I, I grew up listening to him and then eventually became a friend of his. But uh, the audience, uh, airline pilots would tell Bill their kids you know, listen to the show. And Bill would then say, well, if your kids listen to it, how do you recognize me? And, you know, they, uh, it, it was the most back, I want to say back ass words thing possible. And uh, both Bill and I recognized early on, this is back in the uh, like 77, 78, that uh, the audience was enormous. And that's how, you know, when we tried to first create world-class championship wrestling, we didn't have that name for it, but we were, um, uh, you know, our goal was uh, to, you know, create a first-class show, which no one had done uh, with, you know, like five to six cameras and all the location pieces. Uh, and uh, we tried to raise money and people would be, bankers, et cetera, would be a little bit polite. We were trying to raise a million dollars. Back then, TV trucks cost at least half a million. And how it eventually happened was I uh, was hired as a production manager for a TV station. And I told them I would accept the job if they would let me run it like, um, uh, you know, a separate company like Glenn Warren Productions at CFTO in Toronto, who I had done several jobs for as a un union cameraman. Oh, I say the word union, which is really in general not accepted these days, but that was the best training ground. It was better than um, uh, my college degrees. If you made a slight mistake within about 30 minutes, they would have someone else on the location doing your job and you might not work again. But you were so highly paid, uh, $500 and with my overtime, $700 a day. And this is back in the 70s. So, uh, and Glenn Warren cameraman made a fortune. So uh, I got that job and my boss wanted to know uh, if one of the management uh, team, which I was one of them, could come up with a uh, show because they were just introducing movies. They had primarily, th their main thing was the 700 Club. And suddenly they were going to have movies, which they thought would also be a good intro to the 700 Club. And they wanted something to intro the uh, movies and or to promote them at least. And uh, I, I, I figured I'd wait 10 to 15 minutes. I didn't want to sound too aggressive. 
And I came in and suggested uh, my idea of a first class wrestling show. And uh, my boss kind of agreed to do it kind of reluctantly. They let me do a uh, pilot. And Fritz, Fritz von Erich, who ran the Dallas uh, territory, Fritz was afraid that his bread and butter being Channel 11 TV, which was a Fort Worth independent station, would uh, drop him. You know, that was his main thing. It aired uh, Saturday nights, opposite Saturday Night Live, and it cleaned up. It beat Saturday Night Live. And that was part of the reason I came up with the idea, along with Bill Mercer. And uh, uh, so uh, he had me to initially do the show on Tuesday nights. And Tuesday nights, we had such a small crowd. Can you imagine this? We had, uh, with the best wrestlers at that time in the country, we had like 50 people. And I, I got my um, uh, assistant at that time to be a wrestling cheerleader <laughs> because most of these people, you know, when you only have 50 people, you got to get them to be real rambunctious, to be loud and everything. And so she would work with the crowd and get them to, you know, sound like they were several hundred people. And um, uh, the reason for Tuesday nights was uh, Fritz thought Channel 11 would cancel his his uh, Saturday night show, which was his bread and butter. At that point, his bread and butter was the Fort Worth Coliseum. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he had sold out crowds every week. And um, after a while, he realized that wasn't the case and let us move to Friday nights. And next thing you know, we had a sold out audience on Friday nights. And I say sold out, that was like 4,000 people. Uh, the first time we did, uh, well, I think it was all the times we did Reunion Arena, uh, I suggested to Fritz that, uh, change hands here, I suggested that we, um, uh, he let me, there's a thing in commercial television called avails. Avails are available spots. And I went to my boss and said, can we at least get them, uh, you know, if we have a reunion audience with massive crowd, this would really help our distribution. And I suggested that, you know, we have at least $10,000 of avails, which was at that time, maybe four or 500 uh, 30 second commercials. And uh, Fritz wasn't, he didn't really think he needed that, but uh, I promise you it was needed. And, you know, it created this massive audience uh, which was not normally the sportatorium audience of like um, 25,000 people and more. And um, I, th I think if I look at any contributions I had, I, I think that was, that was one of the uh, larger ones. And, uh, and we went on from there to Texas Stadium. The thing I really wanted to do was, you know, shoot the show we had on the road. Uh, New York, uh, Los Angeles, all of that. And I think no one really believed there was a need for doing that or that it would be successful. And as you can see, uh, it was successful. And um, uh, in fact, the manager of the station that took over after me, he killed wrestling. On the, on the, he canceled it. And he told me it was because uh, he thought it was over. <laughs> this is in like 1986 or seven. And I, I, was, I, I had just finished the editing of my film, China Run, which also they thought was, uh, uh, you know, a piece of uh, crap. And uh, it was pretty successful. 
and uh, uh, and so much of that movie I fashioned uh, after uh, wrestling. Well, you know, obviously it grew, and I told him this. I, I said, we're just seeing the beginning of wrestling. And uh, uh, thank goodness at that time, Keith Mitchell and Dan Bynum uh, took it to uh, uh, what we had developed to WCW in Atlanta. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I stayed with my uh, filmmaking, which at this point had uh, moved to work in Vietnam. Um, anyway. Uh, when someone looks at me online, I, I, I think I look like one of the biggest losers possible because I've got a GoFundMe, uh, which I, I look okay sitting here, but uh, I can't walk or move around more than about, oh, an hour to sometimes two hours until the pain starts becoming overwhelming. And... Uh, uh, so, you know, the, I love my work. If, if I wasn't having problems, you know, without question, I'd be working around the clock. Um, all this, uh, for the most part, was a result of falling off a second floor of the National Security uh, Agency of uh, Libya. And um, I, I tripped over some rebar. Uh what a way to end your career, or, or maybe in your career, I don't know. But one thing I can do is uh, edit. And so, you know, it hit me that uh, this idea of uh, doing a director's cut, it actually hit me when I was talking to you, Hannibal. Uh, it hit me that maybe, maybe there's an audience for a more... Uh, fully developed film, which is longer. I love the edit, the current edit that exists. But uh, when you say director's cut, you can put a lot more material in it. And it's really designed for people who were fans of, of the original film. Um, I, I think wrestling has an enormous future and I think it will come out of the independence that exists right now. Uh, Tom Lance's show Fury is, uh, is exciting, you know. And it, I don't know if you can say that for WWE now. Uh, Tom has been working his way up doing this for over 30 years. Well, that's the kind of thing that it takes. Uh, wrestling is not easy. Chris Adams was one of the best spot promoters that, when I say spot promote, that means you go to some small town in Texas, make a deal with the local Dairy Queen so you can eat, and uh, then have a big party after the match you've organized. And, it, you know, it kept a lot of wrestlers working during those uh uh, mid nineties, uh, times. And, um, uh, you know, I, I totally, I totally appreciate that. Well, I hope that sums it up. Uh, you know, if you like gentleman's choice, which I hope you will go to see it. I, I think that Hannibal will put a link on it and also a link for my personal GoFundMe. But uh, the, this, I just came up with this director's cut idea and it won't be that hard and it might be something that you will enjoy. And that's the only reason I do it really. You know, if, if it's not, you know, enjoyable to watch and I say enjoyable, not just, you know, as something giddy and a fun pastime, but something insightful as well. Um, that's, that's one of the things that so many uh, people who have been involved in running wrestling, in my opinion, have forsaken. Uh, they don't realize how intelligent uh, the wrestling audience is and that they are sophisticated as a viewer. 
And uh, I think that's really important and it's been overlooked so often. Uh, back during Shakespeare times, I used to talk to Chris about this, Chris Adams about this a bunch, but I did a lot of my uh, bachelor's degree was also, besides film being my major was in, this is back in the late sixties. If you were in the film department, you were likely amongst fraternities to be considered gay. <laughs> And, uh, uh, the, you know, the thing is, is I, I took all these theater courses. And one thing I learned is uh, Shakespeare uh, at the Globe Theater. It, it, all the activities started about noon. They included juggling. Uh, they also included wrestling. And when the plays happened, the audience... Uh, you know, participated loudly. I don't know if many of you have been to a theater in a uh, dominantly black area, and this is not a racist comment, but the audience has a tendency to really respond uh, to the movie and uh, make comments. Well, that's how it worked at the Globe. You can't imagine that with Shakespeare, but that's a true statement. And, um, you know, that also is what happens in wrestling. The, you know, people will put the wrestling audience down, but hey, they were just like the audience at the Globe. They were responding, they were rambunctious, they were, uh, uh, you know, very enthused and uh, whoever they were in favor of, you know, the audience is going to know it. It's going to be loud. And uh, that's one of the biggest things I love about wrestling is the interplay between wrestlers and the audience. Uh, it's far greater than a rock concert, and, except maybe Frank Zappa. And, uh, uh, you know, it, that's what makes it wonderful entertainment. You know, you're part of it, you know. You're, you're part of the feud that's happening. And you see people with the signs up, all of that. That's what makes or plays such a big role in the entire concept of wrestling. Well, that's it for me today. Thank you, Mickey. I'm not sure if you can hear me now, can you? Well, he can't hear me. There, There's audio issues, but... Bill, thank you for the twenty-five dollars. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's good you let me talk because now the audio's gone again. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. His GoFundMe link is in the description, and it is at the top of the comments. So I'm very sorry about the the audio issues. Our first interview um, with Mickey is also linked in the comments, and there was no audio issues for that one. I'll be back with my uh, daily news update in a few minutes. Thanks a lot for everyone that helped uh, Mickey out.